are we overemphasizing the entrepreneur now? Are we are we kind of selling a dream that isn't going to be suitable for a lot of those people? If you can avoid taking money, you don't want to take money until you've got something that's proven and you've got unit economics that are working, then that's perhaps a really good time to put some fuel in the tank. Number one, it's a big distraction. So everybody I know who's raised venture capital has spent pretty much full time doing that until they get the check. There are human beings that are going to do things that, that they probably shouldn't do, right? Is that unique to entrepreneurs? No, I think it's not. And in fact, I would argue most entrepreneurs are pretty purpose-driven people. They want to they make the world or their little corner of the world a better place. On balance, the world is a much better place because of Steve Jobs and Michael Dell and Manish Sabarwal, the team leads in India, and Elon Musk and, and all the others, large and small, who've, who've created innovations that serve uh, customers and society most of the time very, very well. I don't think we're selling dreams. I think the media maybe sell dreams. Want people to say, look, here's an opportunity that's among the things you can do. And, and by the way, if you do this and do it well, you might just change the world. What's the most important reframe you'd offer to unlock the next step towards big impact for entrepreneurs? Hi, I'm Chris Caldwell, and welcome to Season 3 of Conversations on Climate. John, thank you so much for taking the time to come and have another conversation on climate with us. Uh, happy to see you, Chris. Yeah, it's great. Uh, here at London Business School, glorious day. Ah, the elements are treating us well. They are. <laughs> Today. <laughs> today. Today is very true. Not always the case. But um, so just to, to kick off, uh, there's a lot of people out there who will claim to have unlocked the secrets of entrepreneurship and we are prepared to be teaching the world on it. But you're really unusual in that you came from big business, uh, like The Gap. You then moved into entrepreneurship yourself. You got some very solid experience there. And then you move into academia and uh, authorship and you know, be a pop popular writer. Would you care to kind of take us through that, that journey? Mm. Well, well, first of all, Gap was not a big business when I joined it. It was uh, in its early stages. Yeah. It had 100 stores, so it was a modestly sized business. But that's where I really learned about growing a business. And I got fascinated with the process of how you do that and how you manage the cash and how you find the people and, and do all of that in a people-intensive business, retailing, brick and mortar retailing at the time in the US. So that was a fantastic informative experience. Then I, I did two startups after that. One of those went public, that one failed. So I learned an awful lot there. And, and by the time I'd done all of that, I'd been in the retailing industry 20 years, and the retailing industry is a tough place for many reasons. And I said to myself, I was in my early 40s, should I do something else for the rest of my career? And, and I got some career counseling, as one might do at such a juncture, and uh, it turned out I should either be a business journalist or a professor when I grow up. And I said, well, I can, I can road test the latter path. Let me see if I can get somebody to let me teach a course. Uh, which they did, and I had a great time doing it, and I did well at it, and I said, here's my path, and, and off I went. Then I had to get a PhD to really do it right, so I spent some time doing that, but it's been a fantastic second career. And I'm better at what I do in the classroom because I've had the 20 years of real-world experience. Of course, of course. Now, um, you're a great storyteller, one of the one of the things that uh, really set, set you apart, and st you've come up with some fantastic case studies to be illustrating your points. Um, there is a danger in you know, the world of social media of a kind of copy this culture where people just say, oh, they've done this, so you need to be, you need to be following this model. And uh, it can be quite often kind of ill-informed, ill-thought-out. Ill How can you tell a good study, a, a good study, a good case, a good uh, story from a bad one? How do we know what is a good model to be trying to replicate? Well, well, case studies are central to what I do, both in the classroom and in my books. 
I, I use them to illustrate principles. Mm -hmm. I don't use them to illustrate right or wrong or better or worse practice. So in, in a case study in a classroom, for example, there's no right answer as to whether the protagonist should go north or south. Uh, we, we know afterwards which of those choices he or she made, but we don't know what the other path would have been. We never know what the other path would have been. So I think the role of, of good stories, good cases, is to bring alive ideas so people can understand them, grasp them, uh, maybe feel them more intuitively than they would just dry information. And I think it like, makes learning sticky, whether it's learning from a book or a podcast or a, yeah. or a case study in, a, in an LBS classroom. Mm -hmm. I guess we just, from that point, you just kind of jump into what, uh, what makes a great entrepreneur. Uh, so you've just, you've written uh, a book recently, um, which uh, advocates kind of changing mindsets and uh, re looking at things from different directions. And you break it down into kind of six rules that uh, should, be, should be challenged, should be, should be looked at. Yeah, so, so Break the Rules came about because I was, I was reflecting on the research that had done before I became an academic on entrepreneurs and business people. So when, when entrepreneurs first got on academics radar in the 1980s, a lot of research was done to try and figure out well, what's the difference between these entrepreneurs, these strange creatures, Steve Jobs, Michael Dell and the like, and successful business people. There must be some difference. And the sum total of a bunch of research was we can't find any differences. And yet I know in my work with entrepreneurs over all these years, there are differences, but nobody had figured out what they are. And I said, well, maybe I can look back at the body of case research that I've done and see if I can discern from that body of qualitative research what these differences might be. And that, and that search led me to these six mindsets that I don't say are required to be a successful entrepreneur, but they are mindsets that many successful entrepreneurs hold. They don't all hold them all, uh, and, and they put them to work situationally. So, you know, say, saying yes we can to an opportunity that perhaps doesn't fit your current skills isn't something that, that comes alive every day. It comes alive when somebody gets, asks you, well, could you do this? And you go, oh, I don't know anything about that, and my team doesn't know anything about that. But yeah, we can do that, uh, and, and off you go. So, so I don't call them rules. I, I, don't, I don't say they are must-haves, but I think to the extent that we can get people in organizations everywhere to think more entrepreneurially, we will have better organizations, more responsive organizations, organizations that respond to all their stakeholders in a, in, in a more effective way. I, I think we need more entrepreneurial thinking and more entrepreneurial acting in the world today and if if more people were to were to adopt these six mindsets or some of these six mindsets that might move the needle just a little bit great and could you briefly describe each of the six yeah so so there are six of these mindsets the first one I call yes we can and essentially it says that when somebody asks you to do something that doesn't fit your current competencies, the conventional business advice is, well, no, you shouldn't do that. You should stick to your knitting. That's how you have a successful business. But actually, entrepreneurs often stray from their knitting when there's another opportunity that's attractive. And then they figure out how they'll procure the resources and the people and so on that they need. So, so yes, we can is the first one. Problem first, not product first. Logic is the second one that I talk about in the book. And what it means is, is entrepreneurs, good entrepreneurs, don't focus so much on the product they're building. They focus on a problem that a customer has. There's, a, there's an investor in California, a famous one named Vinod Kosla, who famously said, nobody will pay you to solve a non-problem. Right. And I think that's a, that's a telling idea. Now, are there other ways to be a successful entrepreneur? Yeah, I think, I think I'd argue that Starbucks wasn't solving a problem when they opened Starbucks coffee shops. We could find a cup of coffee. They were offering what I call customer delight. But, but perhaps the, the safest and mo most direct path to becoming a, a successful entrepreneur is to find a compelling problem that some set of customers have for which you can marshal the resources to solve. So that's problem first versus 
product first marketing. Uh, the third one is, is what I call think narrow, not broad. So in, in big companies today, you probably can't do anything new unless somebody thinks it's going to move the needle. They just don't want to bother with little experiments or things that, that aren't very significant. And in fact, I think that's one of the reasons why we don't get much innovation in big companies today. They won't bother doing little things that might turn into big things. But for entrepreneurs, like Phil Knight, who started Nike, uh, he had a problem. He was the distance runner who could run almost a four minute mile. And he and runners like him had a problem with the running shoes that were sold in those days, which had been made to, for, for runners who run around tracks, for sprinters. Well, distance runners don't run around tracks. They run on dirt roads and country paths, and they're always ste stepping on rocks and sticks and some rodent holes. They get shin splints. They get sprained ankles. Uh, Phil Knight said we need a better shoe for elite distance runners, people like me who can run almost a four minute mile. That was the genesis of Nike. Now, now ask yourself, how big a target market is the market for elite distance runners? It's tiny. But once you start in a small market like that and your runners, in Nike's case, begin to win gold medals, then everybody else who's a runner says, well, maybe I need Nike shoes. And then once you learn how to do that in the athletic footwear business, in that category, the running category, it's, it's not too difficult to call John McEnroe and do tennis or call Michael Jordan and do basketball. So that, that foundation of starting really narrowly with a very narrow target market where you can make something that only you have and you, and you can win uh, is a great way to go. And, and that's how so many entrepreneurs start. Many of the entrepreneurs I know, uh, when, when you ask them what industry in, they're almost not in an industry because they're the only game in town who does the very narrow thing that they do. That's three of them. The, the fourth one is what I call ask for the cash and ride the float. Elon Musk is a great uh, current example. Musk asks for a deposit when we order the car. And then, of course, he, he uses that money to, to build cars. And eventually, we get our car. And uh, people don't, don't really recognize how, how Tesla got its start. Musk was not the founder of Tesla, actually. There was a founding team that Musk joined. And he said, guys, um, let's go sell some cars. So they did a little road show in California. And they said, uh, let's, let's see if we can sell some, some roadsters. This, snazzy little sports car that we're going to build. Well, they did this road show, and in uh, a very short period of time, they sold 100 roadsters at $100,000 a piece. Well, do the math. That's $10 million in the bank with which they can now get to work building the cars, right? Well, that pattern has carried Tesla all the way through its journey. So, so asking for the cash up front, and Michael Dell did that too, of course. How, Michael Dell wanted to sell computers out of his dorm room. Well, the customer had to pay in advance. He'd then buy the parts, get his buddies to assemble a computer, and he'd deliver a computer. Asking for the cash up front is a powerful thing that many entrepreneurs do. Most big, mis big businesses don't maybe bother to do that or, or maybe aren't uh, so compelled to do it because they have plenty of cash. So that's four. The fifth one is what I call beg, borrow, but don't steal. <laughs> The fifth one is what I call beg, borrow, but don't steal. So there are a couple of entrepreneurs in the UK that have built a wonderful treetop adventure business called Go Ape. And they discovered the idea for Go Ape while on a vacation in France, seeing another treetop adventure business there. And they said, wouldn't it be cool if we could bring that to the UK? Well, long story short, they went to the Forestry Commission in the UK, which controls a lot of the woodland. And they said, uh, we have an idea that we think might help you increase your visitor count. And that's an objective that the Forestry Commission had. And here's what we'd like to do. So, so the Forestry Commission basically said, this is the idea we didn't know we were, were looking for. And, uh, and they eventually won an exclusive for 25 years on all of the Forestry Commission sites. And the basic idea was, Go Ape would go in and put its kit on the trees. They didn't need telephone poles like the other ropes courses things did. They'd put their kit on the trees and they'd borrow the parking lots and the loos and the refreshment stand and, and, and the trees 
from the Forest Service. And they'd pay some rent uh, based on the visitor count they got, but, but essentially they didn't have to have all those assets, right? They didn't have to pay for those assets up front because they were able to borrow them. So borrowing the assets you need when you start a business is much better than investing in them. And then lastly, um, entrepreneurs never ask permission. When, when an entrepreneur wants to do something and when it's legal to do so, they just get on with it. They don't, they, they don't uh, spend time figuring out if somebody will let us do this. They, they just do it. And if, they, and, and if it turns out that there are some problems with it, then they'll ask forgiveness later. We probably wouldn't have Uber and Grab and all the and Kareem and all the um, all the taxi businesses around the world, the, the ride-hailing business, had the founders of Uber not just simply gotten started in San Francisco. They read the rules and they said, "Yeah, we're not going to have any taxis. We're not a taxi company," and off they went. Well, needless to say, the the uh, existing taxi operators uh, weren't happy with that, but but they followed that pattern in city after city. Now, now the the caveat I make here, and I think it's an important one, is if the laws are, are clear that you can't do it, then you shouldn't do it. But often the laws simply haven't contemplated what's possible today based on new technology, and, and therefore you can do it. Uh, there's a case study I teach in, in some of my classes on a business in, in India called Team Lease. Uh, Team Lease got started to to basically put India to work. India did not have a temporary help culture at the time Team Lease started, now more than, more than 20 years ago. And, and there was only a modest temporary help business and there were a whole bunch of labor laws in India that conflicted with one another. So as the founder of Team Lease said to me one day, in, in order to comply with all the laws, you have to break 20% of them. So it's, it, it's a legal mess. And he said, well, the right thing to do is create jobs for Indian workers. So we're going to start this business, even though their, their lawyer said, you better be careful here, you might end up in jail. Well, they started that business and Team Lease very quickly became the biggest temporary health provider in all of India. Today, I believe it's the largest private sector employer in India, uh, only topped by government agencies. Um, and they've put millions of people to work. And, 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 and so, I think, I think one of the things that entrepreneurs really have an obligation to do is to move society forward. You know, the real, the real progress we make in our societies today is typically not driven by government. It's driven by private actors who see an opportunity to make something better and they go off and do it. And, and sometimes that means you don't ask permission about, well, gee, should there be new rules here? You just do it and let the rules follow. Mm. Long answer, but those yeah. are the six. Okay, thank you so much. <clears throat> now, just thinking about each of those, um, some of them feel more innate than others. Some of them feel more kind of personality draw. I know this is it, what we talk about in terms of mindsets, and obviously you write the book because you think that people can, can read it and learn and move on mm. uh, with it. But is there a question where it's they're more suitable to some humans rather than others and is or is are some of the the mindsets on, on a spectrum where you might be where some are more learnable than others and others you you really it needs to be within you like for example the, the forgiveness permission one that seems something that's really quite human specific like some people are perfectly comfortable with that and some people would would find that a complete nightmare <laughs> yeah I, I think it's a good quest, question chris uh, my wife Donna is from Minnesota in the U.S., uh, and Donna just doesn't like to break any rules. That's how she was brought up, and, and whatever the rules are, we follow the rules. And she often chides me and says, John, you're breaking rules all the time. Well, I, I don't break laws, but I do things maybe unconventionally uh, because I think they take me where I want to go. Um, so, so I think for some people, some of these come more naturally than for others, and some of them might not be easy for some people to apply. I, I did some quantitative research when I, when I worked on the book to find out, once I discovered these six mindsets, I wanted to find out, well, to what extent do real entrepreneurs actually use these six mindsets? Because a few stories isn't enough to prove the point. 
and, and I did a, a survey and, I, and, and in a sample of, I, I think it was more than 150 entrepreneurs in fast growing companies, the average number of those mindsets, of the six mindsets that they put to work in their business was 3.4. So not everybody does all of them and they don't do all of them all the time. But my point is, if you can adopt one or two of these, or, or use one of them to crack an innovation challenge that's on your plate today, maybe thinking a little differently about the target market, for example, or thinking about the problem first, not your product, uh, I, th I think that can, that can help anybody. I, most of us can do most of them most of the time. There are a couple of exceptions. I, I think in big companies, it's really hard to just get on with it and not ask permission. You know, they have armies of lawyers for a reason, and that's probably not a career-enhancing thing for somebody in a big company to do. So maybe that one doesn't fit in big companies, um, but really all of them can be learned. Okay, great. Um, and you, you frame these as counter-conventional, but if they're really kind of key and core to success, why aren't they conventional? <laughs> why aren't they the norm? Yeah, so people say, well, why isn't everybody doing this, John? Well, well, I, I think there are reasons why some of them uh, don't get done. Uh, suggesting that we can do things outside of our comfort zone and saying, yes, we can, uh, just runs counter to the conventional advice uh, that we've had in business and business schools for 30 or 40 years now. You know? You're supposed to figure out your core competencies, build on them, invest in them, make them more robust, and that's how you build a successful business. And that's true. That is how you do it most of the time. But that isn't to say that sometimes we couldn't step outside those boundaries. That's the point I make with that one. Thinking narrowly, not broadly. Um, all companies should do that. But it's in our nature to look for stuff that's huge. So I read student business plans from time to time, right? And the word that's always in there about the size of the market is huge. My market is huge. Well, you don't want a huge market to start out with. You want a little tiny narrow market that you're the only game in town solving that market's problem and, and when you achieve success in that highly targeted arena then you can move on and maybe serve a large market like Nike does today but that's not where you start um, so I, I, th I think perhaps that's driven in the haste we all have to get big fast uh, and, and similarly with each of the others you know uh, big companies have plenty of cash most of them they don't have to ask for the cash up front and so they don't uh, they have enough money to invest uh, so they invest you know and and they've been taught in business schools like ours that when you do something new well you have to figure out what the cost is going to be to do it then you forecast the cash flows then you calculate return on investment there's all this well-developed stuff that you're supposed to do in a big company Entrepreneurs, not so much. You know, if if I see something I want to do and I can borrow the assets to do it, therefore it doesn't cost me anything to give it a try. Uh, off I go. Best practice is best practice for a reason, and you know all these things are taught in this this fantastic institution for a reason as well. For very good reasons. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but how do we know, and how how can we kind of sense that there's some rules that we should be challenging and some rules that we that that we shouldn't? So, but how do we how can we kind of work our way through that? I I don't know how an individual should think about how and when to challenge the rules. I I think most of us try and fit into the organizational culture where we work and where we live and play. Um, so so I, think, I think breaking rules doesn't come naturally to most people. It, it does come naturally to some, and those people maybe tend more to become entrepreneurs than work in big companies. Uh, but that said, if, if you want to innovate, innovation is the lifeblood of your company's future. And if you want to innovate, that means you're going to have to do something differently. Now, you could call that breaking a rule or, or, or you could call it something else. Mm -hmm. But I believe that's fundamental to progress. And, and we need more people with the mindsets 
to think that way to drive the innovation that that the world so desperately needs. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So we can kind of dig into um, a few of these uh, these mindsets. So one, the first one we'd love to uh, talk about is um, the um, problem uh, problem first, not product, because it it makes me it kind of makes me it kind of explains greenwashing in a lot of cases where people are. Kind of really wedded to a particular product and particular particular way of doing things, but actually the context around them has changed. And but they're still really focused in on this this one particular thing without looking looking at the at the wider picture. Um, have you seen any examples in the sustainability world yourself of of this uh, kind of focus a product first mindset causing issues? Well, well certainly, uh, big oil still loves big oil, right? And they're going to always love big oil for as long as they possibly can. And, and perhaps that's natural because that's, that's what creates the cash flow that enables them to play around with alternative energy sources. Um, now, now, you could argue that we'd get there faster if, if they could change their mindsets and, and work harder to pursue alternative energy. Uh, but perhaps it's, it's not in their nature to do that. They, they grew up around oil, they love oil, they, I know people from Texas, and oil's a religion in Texas, you know? It's, it's really hard to change that. Uh, does that block progress? Yeah, I think it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but in Texas, uh, they're building, I believe, second only to California, more, that more renewable energy than anywhere else in the U.S. It's an energy state. You know, they, they love energy and they, 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 yeah, there's an energy opportunity there. So quite a lot of the, the oil men, men and women in Texas are now kind of moving into that. Maybe they don't like it so much, but they still believe that there's an opportunity. They, they are moving in, into it, but they're able to do so because they have this gas cow called oil that funds it. And, and we live in a capitalist society where you, where you need to deliver cash flow and profits in order to fund the next thing you want to do. That's the way our world works today. And so they're able to do that because they're making good money pulling that black stuff out of the ground. Yeah, uh, Yeah. if there was a proper transition plan, you'd, you'd, you'd be less concerned. But uh, yeah, the, the, the fractional amount of money that's going into green energy as opposed to bore extraction is, uh, is, is pretty striking. Certainly it's not enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, uh, next one would be um, talk about going narrow, because I know you've mentioned it a couple of times uh, before that uh, you know your MBA students come up with big, ambitious business plans with enormous amounts of um, it's unprecedented markets that we can be be, be getting into and all the rest. Um, I know in the sustainability um, and kind of purpose-driven driven world people will tend to try and want to make a really big difference, and a really big difference quickly. And that's where they want to go and do it. They, they see there's a major emergency, oh, climate change, we need to try and solve this, quick, let's go. <laughs> How do we go narrow in that, and where you can actually be making a difference, and you can actually be building a business by focusing in on a, on a small part of the, the big problem? Well, well, these sustainability challenges are indeed huge, mm -hmm. and, and we need lots of people trying to make progress in lots of different ways. And it's not clear at this point which of those ways are actually going to get us where we need to go when we need to get there. Um, my own view is that we need to have a thousand flowers blooming there, and we need lots of people trying to tackle the sustainable, sustainability issues of our time in lots of different ways. They don't all have to have big potential on day one, but if something gets started and begins to work, just like Nike selling shoes to elite distance runners, once you prove a technology or you prove a different kind of business model, I think about how solar has finally taken off after lots of fits and starts due to financing issues and so on. Um, you know, I, I, I think I think when something small works, then it can become big. We need to worry about making the unit economics work at the beginning, and then we can figure out how to grow it. If we got something that's going to work, we can grow it. The, the challenge is making it work, and it's easier to make it work on a small scale where you can focus on maybe the low-hanging fruit where it applies at the beginning.
Okay, fair enough. Now, I think the trickiest of the six is the idea of, um, as you say yourself, like entrepreneurs and permission are like oil and water. Like it's you know the the you know do it ask ask for you know forgiveness rather than permission <laughs> mindset. I think the the issue that kind of comes up with that in a kind of sustainability sense is when we're we're focused in on ESG and there's there's that big G of governments at the end of it. And how do you um, kind of strike the right balance between you know proper governance and avoiding the problems that come from moving fast and breaking things? Because there's plenty of problems that come, come from moving, moving fast and breaking things. How do we minimize the, the problems there while also getting the benefits of entrepreneurship? Yeah, um, moving fast and breaking things is not a phrase I use. I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure that the, work, the world works well if everybody's moving fast and breaking things. That, that leads to anarchy and chaos. Yeah. So I don't, I don't argue that that's what we should do. Um, I, I think the way we make progress is we identify problems, uh, ESG problems, there's a large set of them there, and then we find technologies or business models or other kinds of uh, ways to tackle those problems that hold at least the promise to work. And, and then we try that. And, and if that works, then we grow it. And, and if it doesn't, and it's not all going to work, then we don't grow that one. But if we aren't out there doing lots and lots of small experiments, we're not, we're not gonna make progress. And those experiments are not likely to fall afoul, run afoul of, of governance issues. Perhaps some of them will, but as I say, we're not advocating breaking the law here. We're advocating doing things differently in order to make progress. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you do use um, the, the example of Uber. We use it already mm -hmm. in this conversation, uh, in this context, where they just went ahead and did things, um, and perhaps were not not always the most kind of eth ethical in the way they did it. And Indeed. but they but they wouldn't have managed to get to where they were to where they are now if they didn't break these rules. And, and frankly, some of their policies and practices were pretty appalling, like they're, they're kind of the leaked emails. You really are bordering on the illegal there. And you do, you, you do, kind of, you don't support that. You know, no, you clearly. Yeah. You, you, you know, Uber got into business by saying, we're just going to start this company and, and we're going to worry about how the regulators, regulators will view us down the road. Fine. They didn't have to do gray ball that yielded up fake rides and then canceled those rides. They didn't have to do a lot of the things that they did that were clearly unethical, uh, perhaps illegal. That's an issue for the courts, not for me. Um, they didn't have to do those things. But sometimes you get carried away in your quest to build a, a business. And a big business, uh, you cross some lines that you shouldn't cross. I, I think, arguably, Travis Kalanick crossed some lines he shouldn't have crossed. Did he have to cross those lines? I would argue no. The business would be just as big today, probably, without having done that. But we, we never know. We don't know what the other, mm. what the other path would have brought. Um, so, so, yeah, we, we get tempted sometimes, all of us, in our efforts to grow, we do things that maybe we shouldn't do. I think of Volkswagen and, and what they did to, to uh, enable them to continue to sell diesel cars. Well, it's downright fraud, and the courts have caught up with them. Siemens, you know, big, big company, paid more than a thousand bribes out of a department whose job was to pay the bribes for years and years and years. Well, come on, you know, there are human beings that are going to do things that, that they probably shouldn't do, right? Is that unique to entrepreneurs? No, I think it's not. And in fact, I would argue most entrepreneurs are pretty purpose-driven people. They want to they make the world or their little corner of the world a better place in some way. And, and that's why they're at it. Yeah, they hope to make a profit. And some of them do get too enthralled with the pile of the chips they're piling up on their table. Okay, so they're excesses. Um, but, you know, on balance, the world is a much better place because of Steve Jobs and Michael Dell and Manish Sabarwal, the team lease in India, and Elon Musk and, and all the others, large and small, who've 
who've created innovations that serve uh, customers and society most of the time very, very well. Mm, that's a very kind of positive um, take in, and actually quite, quite rare actually these days. Like uh, one of the, the big questions that does tend to get asked about entrepreneurship and even kind of political leaders or people who've grown, who've grown to certain levels in this particular age, maybe, maybe it's a social media age, maybe it's, it's a sign of the times, but it's, we seem to be rewarding in some ways um, sociopathic behavior because you know you, you mentioned a few names there and like Steve Jobs, Elon Musk, even like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, famously really bad people to work for and work with you know just like um, and then other you know, we can name political leaders who might who fall in the same bucket. Um, is there a tendency to be rewarding sociopathic behavior or like or tendent tendencies in in entrepreneurs you know I don't I don't know that there's a tendency to reward it in entrepreneurs any more than there is a tendency for it to happen and get rewarded in profit-making institutions of all kinds mm -hmm. you, you know the reality is uh, people want to grow in their careers and they want to make their businesses bigger that creates jobs it creates wealth uh, it, it creates the kind of positive impact that they hope to make. Uh, I, I would argue that Elon Musk single-handedly put electric vehicles on the map. Yes, there were EVs before Musk. They weren't selling very well. He changed the world, in my judgment, with regard to EVs. Now, is there a price we've paid for some of that? Per perhaps there is. So, so what do you do with that balance, the cost-benefit balance? Do you... Do you, do you uh, well, that's why we have laws, you know, and, and the laws are there to make sure that those, that those uh, transgressions don't go too far. But, you know, you're not going to stop all of them. Yeah, but we're also in a world where technology and kind of human endeavor, human advancement, human on, um, entrepreneurship, innovation moves quicker than regulations can possibly catch up. No question. And it will always do that. The regulators will never catch the fast-moving entrepreneur because the regulators are doing it oh, oh look what happened yesterday we got to have a, a a law to solve yesterday's problem but they don't know what's gonna what's gonna happen tomorrow yet so and, and the and the legislative uh, sausage machine doesn't work very fast right so by the time legislation catches up to something or other you know life's moved on yeah I'm sure that if somebody sat down today and looked at the state of social media um, as it is, they could write some really great laws for 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but right now, uh, I think social media has, kind of, has, has tipped the world in a particular way, which isn't always which helpful. Which isn't healthy. Yeah. No question. Um, yeah. And a big part of that has been people working within, just trying to kind of push things to extremes and say, well, well, what is the best thing for our algorithm? Well, the best thing for our algorithm is to be feeding this, feeding that, um, playing on this, and things that aren't healthy for, for, for humanity, but they're within the, the bounds of, of, the, of the mindset you're talking about. I, I don't know that it's my job to say what's okay mm. and what's not okay. We have a society that, that is rule bound. Uh, that's, that's the way we work. And so it's the job of that society uh, to create rules, guardrails, if you will, with, within which companies and entrepreneurs operate. But I think it's also the job of those leading those companies to operate ethically and, and responsibly. And not everybody does that all the time. And, and, I, and I think it's sad that that happens. But we're dealing with human beings here, and it's happened in the past, and it's going to happen in the future. Mm. We can cry about it. We can wring our hands and say, oh, oh it's really too bad. Yeah, the, we don't live in a perfect world. And I, and I worry about the world we're we're leaving to my grandchildren. Mm. I don't think it's in some ways in a good place. But, but we got to keep, keep working on it, keep mm. trying. Mm. Yeah, and just another kind of a concern that's, that, that I have is a lot of the people who have led social media down this path are also the same people who are innovating in the world of artificial intelligence and who are, going to, who are ultimately going to be owning and controlling because they've got the dollars behind them to be able to make this great technology um, go down one path, one path or the other. And the regulators are way, way, way behind us. 
-hmm. Yeah. What what can we what can we as as a society as as people who aren't in the re making laws? What can we be doing to try and influence and try and try and keep this big, big, big tool that will take humanity down one path or the other, um, take it down the right path rather than the wrong? Well, I, I, I think it's an issue that almost belongs in families. We, we, we need to raise our children uh, to behave in certain ways. We, we need them to use tools in effective ways. We need to have them not so, for example, AI, you know, it's of great concern to everybody in the education world today. Primarily a great concern in our gatekeeping role, okay, people are going to cheat on exams. But actually, in many other ways, it's an opportunity. It is a tool that's going to be available to tomorrow's workforce, to, never mind today's workforce. We need to teach our students to use that tool effectively and ethically um, and, and put it to work in in responsible, but also, how do I say this, also effective and defensible ways. I, I had a bunch of students uh, working on a group project uh, this term who used AI to quantitatively summarize all the mentions about some certain topics, and they used that to draw statistical inferences about what this company should do. Well, wait a second, that completely overlooks validity and reliability concerns, and they were naively using a new tool just because it's there without thinking carefully about what have I got here? Can I draw this inference, which they shouldn't have drawn? So I think, I think our job in business school, one of our jobs in business schools today is to, rather than discouraging the use of AI, bring it in and let's build competent and ethical users of AI who can put it to work to be uh, more efficient where, where it make, makes work more efficient, to be more effective where it can do that. Uh, but, but, but let's not fear it. Let's, let's bring it into the light of day and, and, uh, and make it work for us, not against us. There's a lot of mythology around uh, the entrepreneur now. Why, why do you think mm -hmm. that is? <laughs> you know, when I first came to the UK in 2000, entrepreneurship was a dirty word here. Uh, no parent wanted their kid to be an entrepreneur. You should be a doctor, you should work in government or, or whatever, but please, you know, no entrepreneurs. That has changed. Uh, and the question is why. I think it's changed for a couple of reasons. I think one reason is the role models we have today, the Michael Dells, the Richard Bransons, the Charles Dunstones, the, the uh, Stelios, pe people larger than life characters, some of them, who have done something very significant that gets into the public eye. You know, EasyJet, for example. I think that's one reason. I think the second reason is there's a lot of media hype around the stories that go really well. So if, if you're Apple or Google or Facebook, you get lots of press. Because look at what you're building, you know? And, and not all of that press is good, but it's all attention, and attention is good. So, so I think it's a combination of some role models and, and a lot of favorable press that have sort of turned, at least in the UK, the, the perception of entrepreneurs upside down. It's now okay to be an entrepreneur, and maybe it's actually even good in some, some circles to be an entrepreneur, although we're a little reluctant to use that word. We have this other word, enterprise, we can use because it's less loaded. I'm always astounded by how we do that. So I think those are the two reasons uh, why there's all this kind of hype mm -hmm. around being entrepreneurs. Um, but as you pointed out yourself, like there's two million people in the UK trying to be, be entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. Like it's fully like one in ten in the US. Like that's a lot of people. Um, yeah. it's, it, it's in the water in the US. But recognize that the US is a big place. It's, it's not maybe in the water in Iowa. It's in the water in California and New York and Boston and Colorado and some other places. So you kind of have to break down the US. But if, if you live in Calif Northern California today, uh, if you look 
at the house next door, the house next door on the other side, and the house across the street, there's somebody in one of those houses who's involved actively in starting a business today. That's how, that's how prevalent it is here. We're not quite there yet in the UK, but we've come a long way in the last 20 years. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned the stories of uh, Mayor Stelios and Richard Branson and the, the, the big, the big successes. But it reminds me of the old, uh, the old parable, I guess, of the you know the, the dolphins who who save people, and being being kind of you know celebrated like you know dolphins. If you're stuck in the ocean, a dolphin or a porpoise will push you to the island and save you, and to be like you're great. But that's survivor bias. That's the, you know the dolphins just like pushing things, yeah. and that you could be and pushed in the opposite direction, but you never live to tell the tale. Exactly. <laughs> you know, it's the same the same type of idea of the, you know, you tell the stories of Richard Branson, but actually what about the, 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 the went in the other way? Yeah. Um, are we overemphasizing the entrepreneur now? Are we, are we kind of selling a dream that, like to one in 10 people in the US, that's a lot, that isn't going to be suitable for a lot of those people? You know, I don't think we're selling a dream as much as we're, we're opening doors to opportunities that people can choose. Mm -hmm. One of the best things we do at London Business School is something called Entrepreneurship Summer School that we've been running for more than 20 years. And in the summer school, students, MBA students, with an idea for a new venture, take the summer in between the two years to explore that venture and figure out, is this something that's really good enough for me to start? In the process of doing that, they also explore themselves. What do I want out of the next stages of my career? Is this, is this entrepreneurial path something for me, or, or is it not? Uh, and I think one of the best outcomes of those kinds of experiences is when people say, yeah, I'm glad I checked that out. I never want to do that. It's not for me. And now I know that, and I can follow another path. I don't worry about the fact that we are selling a dream. I don't think we're selling dreams. I think the media maybe sell dreams, but, but I think those of us engaged in entrepreneurship education want people to say, look, here's an opportunity that's among the things you can do. And, and by the way, if you do this and do it well, you might just change the world. W wouldn't that be a nice mm -hmm. thing? Uh, one of the, the big myths that, that you talk about uh, is about the whole idea of venture capital and about how you know, the construct is, you know, day one, you come up with a great idea, you come up with a pitch deck, and you go in and you get money from venture capital and you, and you change the world. And, and, and then you're rich. And then you're rich. Yeah. Then you're rich and, and famous and all, all of the, the benefits, like endless Lamborghinis are outside your, your driveway. Um, what is the, what's, wrong, what's wrong with that mentality? What's wrong with that, uh, that myth? Could you puncture it for us? Well, well, I think there is a myth today that your first port of call, if you're thinking about starting a new venture, is to find some money. And, and there's just tons of evidence that that's actually wrong. Mm -hmm. I did some research a number of years ago on the U.S. list of the fastest growing companies in the, in the U.S. And I, and I checked to see which of them had raised fastest growing private companies which of them had actually raised any venture capital? And the proportion that had done so was 6%, only 6 Well, where did the rest of them get their money to start up? Well, maybe they got a little money from their friends and family, or maybe they got money from their customer, which I argue is a better way to go. Um, you don't want to take money until you've got something that's, pre if, if you can avoid taking money, you don't want to take money until you've got something that's proven and you've got unit economics that are working, then that's perhaps a really good time to put some fuel in the tank and, and grow it faster. But until that time, raising, raising money has real drawbacks. Uh, number one, it's a big distraction. So everybody I know who's raised venture capital has spent pretty much full time doing that until they get the check. Well, if you're spending full time raising money, what are you not doing with your full time? Well, you're not spending it on your customer and your business and trying to figure out, how do I get this thing right? Because we know that plan A most of the time isn't going to work. So it's a big distraction. Number two, uh, it comes with a lot of baggage. You, you get to see a term sheet and then you get to see a shareholders agreement and I guarantee you will not like the shareholders agreement. You see, it, it gives more rights than you wish the investor will have to the investor. Uh, number three, 
it's risky early, and, and to compensate for that risk, the investor who's investing at early stage needs a bigger piece of your business than they would need if they invested at a later stage. So for all those reasons, taking money early, if you don't have to, is, is you just shouldn't do that. And by the way, what happens is once you get check number one, what do you think happens to the entrepreneur's attention after check number one is deposited in the bank? It's now, what do I have to do to get check number two? So this distraction mm. occurs along the whole journey. So it's far better, in my view, as I argue and break the rules, ask for the cash and ride the float. Get the customer to pay you. And as you know, I wrote a whole book about that called The Customer Funded Business. There are a bunch of ways you can get the customer to give you the money to get started. You don't need capital. Now, will that work for every single business? No, of course it won't. Uh, but it'll work for a surprisingly large array of businesses. It'll work in B2B and B2C. It'll work for, in goods kind of businesses, as Michael Dell showed. It works in virtually every service business because you always ask for money up front in a service business. Uh, so, so people need to, dis need to get away from that myth. The, the, the venture capital investor is simply not your first port of call. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper into that. Um, I think I really enjoyed the, uh, the story of uh, Tesla earlier on and how uh, they went out and uh, took what, $100 million into the bank just from going around and taking, taking, you know, and then taking deposits for similar amounts of money as, uh, as they evolved. Um, and that's kind of intuitively kind of, I can, I can understand that if you are, if you can sell a dream, if you can sell a product, if you're, you're very talented in that sense and you get people to buy into it, you can get upfront payments on kind of big luxury, um, big ticket items. But it feels a little bit more difficult uh, on the, the, say the tech startup models where you're going out and you are, um, trying to sell, where well, you're going to be losing money for a lot of years, and there is no no big big upfront uh, tickets to be paid. Um, I'm just interested, like you've, you've got a, a really good narrative on kind of Airbnb in that sense, and how we can work in a, in that kind of very different model, which to me seems like a much more difficult model model we're trying to work. Could you kind of explain how Airbnb Airbnb did it, or whatever general principles we can take from that? So. It Airbnb operates what I call a matchmaker model. They bring together buyers and sellers, mm -hmm. but they don't, of course, own any of the properties. That's what eBay did, right? Buyers and sellers brought together, they don't, they don't ever touch or own what's bought and sold. There are lots and lots of businesses today, as we all know, that are matchmakers in that sense. Many of those were started with essentially no capital. Yeah, maybe you max out a couple of credit cards. That's what the Airbnb guys did. But, but fundamentally, you don't need capital to do that because you don't have inventory. You're not tying up cash and assets. You've just got to find a way to bring customers on board, and then you've got to find a way to bring suppliers on board. And if you're solving a problem, back to problem first logic, if you're solving a problem that's compelling to the supplier, they, they they have empty, uh, so one of my former students at London Business School built a, built a business in New York to do salon bookings on an app. Well, well, the salons had a problem. They had lots of cancellations that they couldn't fill last minute, um, and they had empty seats. They wanted, they wanted their salons to be full. The customer had a problem because Hillary uh, was working really hard in her day job and she just never had time to stop and call her salon when she needed her haircut or whatever. So she said, we're going to start this thing, open table for salons, right? Well, if you can solve a, a compelling problem on both sides of the dyad, you can get started with little or no capital. That's what the Airbnb guys did. If, the, if you want to then grow that very fast, then maybe you need to put fuel in the tank. And one of the problems with these matchmakers is that anybody can do it. So you can start one today and, and I can see you doing it and say, oh, I could do that too. And so the barriers to entry are very low and they tend to become winner take all games, which means that at some point, a whole bunch of capital needs to go in in order to win the, in order to win the foot race to size. Well, that's fine. Uh, but, but you don't have to build all of them into businesses the size of Airbnb, for example. There are lots of matchmaker businesses that are much smaller, 
Uh, they, they match dog walkers with people who have dogs, for example. Well, that's not going to be a huge business, but, but there are a couple of very successful businesses that do just that. And they can be built with very little money at the outset, provided they're solving problems on both sides of the diet. I'm conscious that some of these models may be more applicable in different economic times. Obviously, you were thinking about them uh, during times, well, I was thinking about them for years, but most recently, where there was times that uh, money was essentially free mm -hmm. and economic conditions were a bit more buoyant. <clears throat> Is there anything that's You'd, that you'd like to update on that? Like, for example, the, the Elon Musk Tesla model might be a bit more difficult to achieve now where people are a bit more cash constrained and there's a bit more, a bit less of a demand for, a demand for, for luxury goods. Um, or even the kind of the borrowing of excess capacity. When businesses are feeling more constrained, they might be making cutbacks, so there'll be, there'll be less excess capacity. Is there any, anything that this new economic environment um, has led you to, to re rethink what you, what you have been kind of recommending over the years? I, I, I think, if anything, what we're seeing in the current environment is that these, these mindsets become even more important. So, so while it's easy to think that, that Tesla was able to ask for cash up front because it's working with high-end consumers who have more money than they know what to do with, uh, there are tons of other examples. Michael Dell starting Dell Computers and selling Dell to very, selling computers to very small businesses out of his dorm room. That wasn't a high-end kind of deal. There's Costco today that operates these these stores for for the middle classes, basically, and and you have to pay in advance to shop at Costco. You can't even walk in the door unless you pay your 50 pounds or whatever it is to be a member. Well. Guess what? The 50 pounds added up, yours and mine, and, and adding all of those up constitutes two-thirds of Costco's operating profit year in and year out. Wow. Well, if you've got that kind of model, how are you going to, if your target are Marks, Marks and Spencer, how are you going to compete with that? Costco can run the retailing operation almost at break even because it's got two-thirds of its profit already in the bag. So there's this perception that, yeah, Musk can do that, but it's, it doesn't work here or it doesn't work there. It works lots of places. Mm. I, I, I even know a restaurant owner who, who uh, was, was the kind of restaurateur. He was a chef, a really good chef, but he was not working in his own restaurant. He was in New York, and, and he wanted to open his own place. But he was the kind of chef who always went out to the front of the house to get to know his customers. So he knew his customers. And when he set out to open his own place, he went to his customers and said, you know, I'm going to open my place. I need to fund it. I, I, I have a proposal for you. I'd like you to buy 10 dinners for 10 people and pay me now. Uh, and then when I open, you can redeem those 10 dinners for you and 10 of your friends, and you pay half the price. Well, that's how we funded his new restaurant. Well, that's not rocket science, right? And it's, it's not high tech, and, and yet here we are. Yeah. Um, one of the things that people tend to do in, this, in, in a more difficult economic environment is they tend to agonize over things. They just spend an awful lot of time uh, trying to control the uncontrollable. And in an entrepreneurial space, that can lead to people spending a lot of time on business plans. <laughs> and that's something that I'm sure you disagree in fundamentally. Would you care to, uh, to tell us why business plans are not necessarily the best way to be structuring your business? Well, for a long time, uh, when, when entrepreneurship got onto business schools' agendas and, and on university agendas, they said, well, how are we, how we going to teach this stuff? Well, well, let's have a course in which people write a business plan for a new idea. And, and that was a really nice idea because it got, got students engaged in actually doing stuff outside the classroom, gathering data, talking to customers, all that kind of stuff. The problem that, that happened in those early years was that it was typical that at the end of the term, the students would be asked to pitch to a panel of local angel investors, maybe. Well, the good students would figure out about halfway through the term that, you know this idea we got here? It's no good. It's not going to work. But they've been tasked with writing a business plan to say how wonderful it is and pitching that plan to these investors. Well, that puts students, I think, in a, 
in a bad place. And it's one of the reasons why years ago I wrote the New Business Road Test and said, wait a second, let's assess the opportunity first. And if we find we like the opportunity, then let's go write a business plan. But, but maybe we don't even have to write that plan. Maybe we can just start doing some little experiments and figure out if this is going to work before we write a business plan. So I, I think there's too much emphasis on planning. And in an uncertain world, which the entrepreneurship world is, planning is not likely to be particularly helpful. That doesn't mean you shouldn't plan. Of course you should plan. But, but you know, you, you're probably not going to be faithfully executing that plan. It's, it's highly likely that you're going to have to pivot and uh, it's plan B or C or D or Z, who knows, that's going to actually take you where you want to go. Yeah, yeah, and the old uh, Mike Tyson <laughs> quotes, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. Mm. <laughs> Yeah, um, but you know, in this context, uh, one of my kind of uh, favourite kind of stories you tell are about the 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 unk unks, <laughs> um, and the, the the pair of rock climbers. Could you, take, could you care to uh, to share what what an unk unk is, please? Well, an unk unk, uh, Chris, is an unknown unknown. It's it, it's something you don't know that you don't know. So one of the challenges entrepreneurs face in the early days is trying to figure out is this idea any good and and they have a lot of ideas in their head typically of why it might not be. Well, we don't know about this and we don't know about this and this and this. And so they're, they're inclined to go get answers to those questions that they already know. Mm -hmm. But there are other questions that they don't know they don't know the answer to. And so the question is how do you, how do you get to those? There were a couple of uh, aspiring entrepreneurs at LBS who spent the summer in the entrepreneurship summer school trying to figure out whether an idea they had to build fitness centers that were kind of based around rock climbing instead of the, the conventional ones we have today. Um, and, and, and there are a bunch of questions they knew they had to get answers to about why this might or not work. And, and, and those are the known unknowns. And you can go get answers to those questions. But there are always some things in a new venture where you don't know what those unknowns are. And, and so along the, the way, as they were doing long interviews with people in the fitness arena, trying to discover whether this idea had any merit, uh, using a procedure uh, called the long interview that has roots in social sciences, they discovered that there was a fundamental issue that they hadn't un understood, and it was the Achilles heel. And, and that was th that there's some kind of rules of thumb about what makes the unit economics work. And, and you've got to make essentially, I think it is, what's, there, was a, there, there was a rule of thumb about you needed one pound of revenue against a certain, certain level of costs. And, and, they, um, and they discovered it was just going to be too costly to put all this rock climbing gear in. And, and you could never charge enough for the fitness to pay for the investment up front. So in spite of the fact that they got favorable answers to the known unknowns, the unknown unknown that they didn't know to ask, but this procedure led them to, uh, was reason enough not to start the business. And they said, Phew, <laughs> glad we didn't start that one. Yeah, save them a big headache. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you mentioned the new business road test, and I, as much as I would love for us to be going through going through that book in in more detail, uh, we we sadly just don't have a ton of time. Maybe maybe a follow up interview sometime in the future. Um, but so instead of asking you to dig into that, could I just ask you, because what's one approach to identifying opportunities that is often overlooked? There are lots of people in this world. Uh, who want to work for themselves. Mm -hmm. and, and often they tell me, but I don't have an idea. <laughs> and, and my advice to them is to put a little pad of paper in their pocket or their phone or whatever and create what I call a bug list. And as you go through daily life, write down on your phone or on this little pad of paper everything that bugs you that's just not quite right. Mm -hmm. and, and if you do that every day, you, you'll you'll do a couple of things. Number one, you'll greatly enhance your observation skills. So you'll notice things around you that perhaps you wouldn't have seen before. And number two, at some point, you might find something on your bug list where you go, oh, aha, that's a big bug. And 
I think it's a compelling one that, that other people besides me are going to find to be a bug. And perhaps I have the skills or the interest or whatever to tackle that one. And that may then lead you into business. So, so that's a, a nice approach that anybody can do. They might take them where they want to go. So um, something that kind of jumped out at me when uh, looking at your research was the idea that uh, when you looked into kind of the global south, um, the global what? The global south. Um, uh -huh. so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Emerging markets, developing markets, uh, small island communities. Um, that there is a different type of entrepreneurship there, and, and uh, an entrepreneurship that comes up with different ideas and different ways ways of doing things, like broader than you had expected when you were uh, kind of initially taking your your perspective, kind of northern hemisphere perspective, in, into the southern hemisphere. Um, is there something particular in the? the market structures that you see in the global south that um, promotes different ways of thinking? Like perhaps because there's no like functioning venture capital um, to, to speak of? Yeah, I, I think in the global south, uh, resources are so constrained mm -hmm. that one has to think about problem solving in different ways. And, and one has to get to the, the root of what's, what's the real problem. And, and once you get there, often you find something that can be done at vastly lower cost than it's done in the West or the North, uh, and, and perhaps then brought to the North as, as a different solution. And, and a story comes to mind of a woman who, who was concerned about the very high numbers of infant deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and the problem was that babies were being born in rural villages and they weren't near hospitals and they couldn't get to incubators and and and, and so she said well we we need to build a better more affordable incubator to, to prevent these infant deaths well as she dug into that problem and used a process called design thinking she realized that, that actually the world didn't need it a better or different incubator. The world needed something that would enable those babies to retain their body heat from the moment they were born in some rural setting. And she developed w what amounts to a bag in which the baby can be placed that holds the, the, the baby's hit. And it's dramatically reduced the, the uh, infant death statistics. And it's very inexpensive. and, and and she and the nonprofit, and now the for-profit spin-off that has, be, has come out of that uh, ha have saved, uh, I'm not sure whether it's hundreds of thousands or millions of lives today, uh, but, but they had to get to the core problem, mm. which wasn't how to build a better incubator, it was, it was how to save infants' lives. And once they did that, that opened the possibility to approach the problem in a different way. I, th I think we're seeing lots of that, especially in the medical arena, where resources are, are quite limited and, and people are finding solutions to uh, developing world problems that turn out to be efficacious in our world as well. Great, yeah, that's, yeah, that's a wonderful story. And it brings me back to, um, to, to break the rules. Do you think that the, the book and its teachings and its um, and what, what can be picked up from it in terms of mind shifts for, for entrepreneurs uh, applies as equally to the global south as does does to the to, to the you know the context it was written in? I, I think the principles in Break the Rules apply pretty much everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yes, the global south is resource constrained, but but there's still problems that have to be solved and by thinking narrowly you're more likely to solve those problems. You, you, you don't have money to invest, so you have to borrow resources. That, that applies. You can do things that are perhaps out of your comfort zone. In fact, it's probably necessary that you often do that. So, so I think these tools apply pretty much anywhere and everywhere and at all times. Great. And um, you mentioned the... Um the, the summer school, uh, the entrepreneurship summer school. But something else as part of part of the program um, you do is you take MBA students to the Global South for for, for studies. And like right. last year, you went to to Sao Paulo. That trip there, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and you were working with the what the triple bottom line startup community. Yeah. 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 
Exactly. Yeah. So uh, what does that experience teach you about um, impact startups outside of Europe and the US? When Rupert Merson and I took, took 60 MBA students last year to Sao Paulo, it was, uh, it was the third year, second, third year we had, we had done it, we were struck by how purpose-driven so many entrepreneurs are there compared to here. I've, I've always said our entrepreneurs here are purpose-driven, and they are, but in, in Brazil, perhaps because of the uh, environmental issues and constraints and opportunities that Brazil faces with the Amazon and so on, it's top of mind there. Mm. And, and so we were really struck by how creatively Brazilian entrepreneurs are thinking about the ESG problems, especially the E part of the ESG problems, and how innovative they are with coming up with solutions to some of those problems. And, and the result of that is that there is today a whole category of purpose-driven entrepreneurs matched by a, a whole cadre of purpose-driven impact investors who are looking to invest in exactly those kinds of entrepreneurs. So it's a, it's a fantastic ecosystem to study and I think it was an eye-opening experience. Now, of course, working cross-culturally does have certain drawbacks. Like you, you're working in environments that um, have different different norms to, to, to yourself. Um, how has your study of um, Celtel and uh, Mo Ibram uh, kind of taught you about how to deal with these types of you know, moral dilemmas that entrepreneurs face? We have an alumnus whose name is Terry Rhodes, uh, and Terry had worked with an entrepreneur named Mo Ibrahim, and Mo wanted to go to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and bring, bring mobile telephony to that region, where it pretty much didn't, didn't exist. Terry joined in that effort. And I ended up writing a case study on, on what they did. But I think, I, I think the profound thing that happened there is they said, we're entering into a a world that we know is rife with corruption. So we're going to find ways to avoid being corrupt as we build this business. So for example, when somebody, so they'd, they'd have to find a hill to put a cell tower on, for example. Well, the owner of that land would want a bribe, uh, or the government official to give the permit would want a bribe. So, so rather than paying a bribe, they'd say, well, how about if we build a school or, or something else? Uh, so they developed a whole array of strategies um, to avoid paying bribes. One, one of the toughest places w was in customs because all the kit had to come from outside, of course. None of it's made in Africa. And customs people are notorious for needing a bribe to get your stuff through. Well, they, they decided they would adopt a policy called let it wait. And when the guy in customs said, I need a bribe to clear your goods. I, I, I'm sorry, we, we don't pay bribes. We, we'll just let it wait. And eventually, the customs guy would realize that he wasn't going to get paid for that shipment, but it was kind of clogging things up, and it might be better to move it out and get some more profitable shipments into the, into the customs clearance center. So, so they developed a whole array of ingenious ways to avoid paying bribes. In the process of doing that, they brought mobile telephony to much of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they went from zero to, to a $3 billion exit in only eight years. Wow. And the coolest thing is they created more than 100 native African millionaires who were shareholders in the business who had learned to operate ethically in that context. Very good. That's the biggest outcome. Yeah, very, very cool. Very, very cool. Um, so you've written some great books over time, and you've covered an awful lot of the issues that, um, that entrepreneurs face. And um, I just mentioned to you before we, um, uh, we, got, we came on camera, your new uh, business rose test is the number one book I give to friends. <laughs> Anyone who considers this, it's like, that's it. Just read this book. Before you do anything else, read this book. It's, it's fantastic. Um, 
Is there another problem that you, you feel that you've got an itch you want to be, be, be writing about? There's, is there something else that, that what, on, on your, your, your list that you, <laughs> you have in your pocket? Is there something else you want to be dealing with and helping on? Chris, I often, I, I often get asked, so what's next? What's your mm -hmm. ne next book going to be? And, and, and my first book, The New Business Road Test, I didn't know that there was going to be a next book. I wrote The New Business Road Test because we needed a way to assess opportunities. There was nothing in the literature. Um, I then wrote Getting to Plan B with Randy Commissar because at the time the phrase business model was at the tip of everybody's uh, tongue and, and I didn't think anybody knew what they were talking about when they used the words. It seemed, it seemed like those words were buzzwords and, and they were just getting thrown about and it wasn't, wasn't clear uh, what, what they meant. So Randy and I wrote Getting to Plan B to deal with that problem. Um, in the course of writing Getting to Plan B, we discovered Costco and its business model. And I said, oh, this is really interesting. This company has grown like crazy. And, and it's done that by getting the customer's money basically up front to pay for it. I wonder if there are other ways to do that. So that wonderment led me to the customer-funded business and the discovery that there are five ways to do that, as it turned out. And, and then uh, I didn't think there was going to be a, another book, but I was just contemplating um, th the need that we have in the world for people to think and act more entrepreneurially. At least that's the need I believe we have in all kinds of organizations. And, and that contemplation led me to think back over my body of case research that I've done over the last 20 years or so. And then I realized there's a book there, and so I wrote the book. So will there be another book? Well, there'll be another book if there turns out to be another problem that I can solve by doing some research that will lead to a book that solves that problem. What that problem is, we'll see. Yeah, that seems like a great way to end because it just kind of it summarizes the entire body, body of work up to up to now in a couple of minutes <laughs> which is fantastic so just to to finish off we always ask for a little piece of advice as uh, as our final question so what we discussed before uh, impacts and you know how entrepreneurs might be thinking about um, or might be too hungry to be going out and trying to trying to make a big impact quickly um, could you tell us what What's the most important reframe you'd offer to unlock the next step towards big impact for entrepreneurs? For entrepreneurs who want to make an impact on the climate challenges we face today, I think my advice to them would be don't worry about trying to solve the entire climate, climate problem with what it is you're going to do, but rather carve out some little piece of that where you bring the skills and insights to that piece of the problem that you think you have a a technology or a business model or some other approach that can solve that piece of the problem. If, if we have a thousand entrepreneurs each solving a little part of the problem, we'll make a lot of progress. And that's where I think you should start. Okay, amazing. John, thank you so much for your time. I thoroughly enjoyed the conversation. This was fun, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us on that conversation. We hope that you enjoyed it. We hope that you uh, learned something. If you did enjoy it, please feel free to leave a five-star review and to subscribe to any of our channels and we'll be sure to keep you updated on future productions. These are conversations that you just can't afford to miss.